Hello, my name is Ryan Lunsford. I am a uh, department manager in the pharmaceutical section here at Nelson Labs. And today I am presenting on particulate matter testing of cardiovascular devices. Um, I've been a study director in the particulate matter testing area for about seven years. And I have conducted many tests on a variety of, of devices, including many cardiovascular devices. Um, we have given a webinar previously on particulate matter testing in general of pharmaceutical products and have touched on devices to an extent. Um, this, is, this webinar is designed to address specifically cardiovascular devices and some of the, uh, some of the intrinsic uh, issues that, that we may encounter with cardiovascular devices as well as the um, other issues that regulatory has asked us to address. Uh, a little bit different than other medical devices um, and certainly different than uh, pharma, uh, pharmaceutical products or injectables, which is really where particulate testing kind of uh, originated from but has now grown to cardiovascular devices because of the concern for particulate matter on these devices and the uh, threat it may expose the patient to. So moving right along, First, what is particulate matter testing? USP 788 defines particulate matter uh, testing as sizing and counting of extraneous mobile undissolved particles other than gas bubbles that are unintentionally present in a solution. So this is in regards only to a solution since the USP uh, does not deal with medical device uh, particulate matter content. Uh, however, in this case, obviously, uh, we would probably substitute that solution with device. Um, and in addition, there are a few other uh, areas of particulate matter that may change this definition or add to it a little bit. In the case of a vascular medical device, we're also concerned about the detection of residual material from the manufacturing process, such as millings, shavings, and uh, which may include plastics or metals or other, other components not normally found in a solution. Um, also, environmental contamination. Uh, usually we find this is skin or dust, uh, clothing fibers, things of that nature that just come from the uh, environment that the device is being manufactured in. Also, packaging remnants are a concern. We often find fibers, um, adhesives, or paper-based materials um, that are present on the device from the packaging that it's exposed to. The packaging of the device is usually significantly uh, larger in surface area and more complex than that of a solution. And also the material that may come loose from the device during use. This is a big concern from regulatory um, coatings, uh, such as hydrophilic coatings or drug coatings, uh, mostly because this is a bit of a gray area. Sometimes these coatings um, are undissolved initially, but may dissolve over time. However, because the undissolved nature of some of these coatings may cause uh, issues in the patient for a short time, um, they're still of concern. So we'll discuss those a little bit further later on. These are a few micrographs that we've taken of various particles just to kind of give you a, an illustration of what we're looking at. Most of these are taking, taken at 100x. So you can see they vary considerably by size and shape and color. We're often able to tell our customers, uh, or, or rather the customer is often able to tell where uh, in the, on the device um, their particles are coming from based on the morphology or color of the particles uh, you know, when, when we take micrographs when they request. So there's a few examples. As you can see, some pretty, pretty gnarly fibers there at the bottom, um, as well as some pretty large particles. I don't have a scale here, but these are taken at about 100x, so most of these in the range of 20 to 100 microns. Here's a few other particles um, that range anywhere from about 265 microns all the way down to about 25. These are representative of, of typical particles we see, kind of white, translucent, or opaque particles um, that are, are typical of environmental contamination. So going into briefly on the concern for particulate matter on vascular devices, this is somewhat repetitive from our previous uh, particulate matter webinar. We're, the main concern from uh, particulates on medical devices comes from the uh, unknowns that may occur from these particles being introduced into the bloodstream. Um, particle implantation into the blood vessel or tissue 
uh, may cause uh, issues such as blood vessel irritation or an immunological response. Um, this may lead to swelling or clotting, which may uh, lead eventually to even an embolic occurrence. So uh, the, the, the general idea is that we eliminate as much of this particulate matter, this foreign substance, from the device as possible. Um, there are quite a few unknowns as well because uh, the particulates that are exposed to the patient may have different effects based on their composition and the patient's immune system. Um, uh, the immune response is one of those big unknowns. We're not really sure in many cases what effect uh, will come from the immunological response of those particles. It may be completely benign and, and non, uh, non-occurring, but on the other hand, uh, significant swelling or clotting or, or, or clumping of cells um, is, is likely to cause a significant uh, uh, clinical issue. There's also the regulatory concern, um, obviously from the liability of the aforementioned effects, um, but also because high levels of particulate matter can often indicate insufficient controls or sloppy techniques, whether that be the manufacturing process, the raw materials, the packaging process, the shipping or handling, uh, so on and so forth. There's also, as I mentioned, the unknown risks. Uh, there isn't a great deal of clinical data um, regarding particulate matter and how it may affect uh, different patients in different circumstances. Um, and so based on that, uh, it tends to be the policy of most regulatory agencies to err on the side of caution, obviously. So particulate matter testing basics, that's what PM stands for, is particulate matter. You probably figured that out and use that a lot from here on out. Um, what I want to go over first is what to include in your particulate uh, matter testing um, scheme uh, based on the type of device you have and also the equipment that may be used in that test. So step one of the basics is to create a protocol that mimics clinical use of the product. Um, our, our whole purpose is to mimic an in vitro or to create an in vitro test that will closely mimic the use of the product and thus be able to show us potentially what particulate matter may be generated during the process. It is frequently uh, recommended to incorporate a vascular model if applicable, if your device uh, is, is strictly vascular such as a guide wire or a catheter, uh, stent delivery system, so on and so forth. Um, if it's an implantable, that's not usually as important, and we'll get to that a little later. But in the case of most vascular devices, a uh, vascular model is recommended by both the FDA and by, uh, by most third-party labs to exercise and to show integrity of the device and the particulate matter that may slough off of the device when, uh, when essentially subjected to that tortuosity. Um, down at the bottom, on the bottom left-hand corner, I have the ASTM F2394 model. This model is frequently referred uh, or referenced by the FDA to many of our customers as a starting point uh, for uh, their device. It is not applicable to all devices. Um, it does have a rather small ID, so in the case of products with a larger ID or OD um, or with significant rigidity may not work with this model about maybe 25% of our customers have used this model for their device um, because the other 75% have found that it's you know, either too tortuous or um, will not allow for the uh, device to fully scale the entire path. Uh, regardless, it's a good starting point. Um, there are many other models we have on hand. Um, usually we recommend to our customers to uh, design a model or to choose a model based on the um, anatomical uh, vasculature that their device will be most typically exposed to. Uh, continuing, um, we also recommend, uh, as does uh, the FDA and other uh, guidance documents, to include accessory devices used in testing. The purpose for this is to determine if additional particulate may be generated from exposure of your device to the other accessory devices used clinically. Um, it, this does create some issues sometimes though because we want to make sure that we're not uh, gathering particulate matter from those accessory devices. So usually a control is performed prior to use of these, control, of these accessory devices to make sure that they're clean and that uh, they're not contributing to your count significantly 
uh, of, of your device and it's kind of contaminating your test results. Uh, but it is it is definitely recommended. Uh, we have had several occasions where um, our our client has decided not to use them for one reason or another and has been kicked back or their submission has been kicked back because of, of non-inclusion of those accessory devices. Last part of step one is to assure that aging and sterilized products are included in the representative group of products that you'll be testing. Um, also uh, as a representative group including different sizes, types, or shapes of your device. Um, as an example, at the bottom I have a few illustrations of different shapes of a guide catheter on the right hand side and different sizes and ODs of a stent. Um, we recommend including different sizes, not just a worst case scenario, but also you know, maybe the smallest, somewhere in the medium and the largest, if that applies to your device. Um, and the purpose of this is just that aging and sterilization may have an effect on, on particulate matter content. Uh, we find this isn't always the case. Um, it, it sometimes happens that the largest device, for example, has no more particulate matter than the smallest device. But it's good to get an overall view, and we have definitely gotten uh, sponsors who have gotten their submission kickback for not including uh, the variety of devices in their test scheme. So that's something to remember. Going on to step two, is to perform a method validation on the procedure that you're performing. Once the procedure is finalized and uh, you have a test scheme in place, it is important to validate that method to assure that particulates generated in that method are captured and included in the analysis. Um, Nelson Labs has been conducting these particulate uh, matter validations for about six years now. Um, per the FDA's Class II Special Controls Guidance Document for certain PTCA catheters. I'll also include a link to that at the end. Um, that is a document published in 2010 from the FDA uh, providing guidance regarding particulate matter and a host of other tests that they recommend be conducted on PTCA catheters, but they've tended to use that for a lot of other vascular devices as well. So it's, it's a document that's very helpful. Um, section 13, which I'll go over briefly, covers particulate matter. But coming back to the validation, the validation's purpose is not necessarily to show that particulate matter is removed from the device. That is a, a common misconception. Um, that essentially is captured in the test. And in many cases, the device uh, does not shed the full amount of the particulate matter that it may contain. So that's not necessarily the purpose of this validation. Again, the validation is just to show that particulate matter that is exposed to that vascular model is flushed out and captured so that it's included in the analysis. The important thing to remember is that that vascular model represents the patient. So if a great deal of particulate matter is, say, generated, but only a small part is actually flushed out or retained in the extract fluid that is analyzed, then that is not a uh, an accurate representation of the particulate matter load that will be exposed to the patient. Going on with step two, the validation. This is typically performed by spiking the vascular model with a known concentration of particles. Uh, we typically use mistraceable standard particulate solutions that are prepared, uh, pre-prepared, um, and then run a analysis on those prior to use to make sure that we know for certain the exact content of that solution. The procedure is then carried out as written but without the test device. The purpose for that is that the test device may uh, artificially inflate the results. So we include the accessories. Uh, we make sure that they're clean prior to use by running a control, but we do not, use, do not include the test device, only the test accessories during the validation. Following are the recoveries that the FDA's PTCA document has provided. Um, they're looking for a 90% or greater recovery for the 10 and 25 micron particles. Those particles are also the ones that are analyzed in the USP 788. And then according to their wording, uh, if I remember correctly, um, a 75% recovery for the largest particle size um, that is at least greater than 50 microns. So. The, the, the purpose here is to measure a larger sized particle um, because of the significance of those large particles. 
um, and to get at least a 75% recovery from that size. So we typically use somewhere between, oh, a 60, 70, maybe an 80 micron particle for that, that greater than or equal to 50 micron size. Uh, in the case that your model or procedure does not meet these recovery percentages, we do recommend um, investigating if it is the model itself, maybe the accessories, or maybe the procedure. Maybe a more thorough flush needs to be performed. Um, maybe the devices, or the accessory devices, are harboring some particulate. Um, we've seen a wide variety of causes for failures. Most of the time, we're able to validate most procedures if they have a uh, significant enough flush, or a sufficient enough flush, rather. Um, because that flush is really, uh, that, that flush that's performed after testing or exercising of the device in the model is really what tends to flush those particles out and allow us to, re to, to um, analyze those sufficiently. Step three is to execute the test. And uh, there's a few points to remember. This should be the easiest component of the test, because at this point, we have a validated procedure. We have a procedure that includes all of the important aspects. But there are a few other uh, important notes to take regarding executing the test. First, to include a sufficient quantity of devices to provide some statistical significance. There's not a ton of guidance here. Um, there is a, a technical information report from ANSI Amy, which I'll get to in a little a few minutes, which does give some guidance on sample size. But this is mostly dictated by your internal SOPs or just simply uh, determining how many devices may be required in a, a standard lot of product in order to obtain a certain uh, statistical significance or, or confidence interval. Um, also, it's important to assure that your lab technicians performing the test are sufficiently trained in a septic technique equipment operation and the devices handling. Um, that's the, those are kind of obvious, but aseptic technique, um, we have seen sloppy aseptic technique where we will obviously uh, observe large uh, quantities of particulate that aren't necessarily representative of the device simply due to sloppy uh, handling or, or sloppy uh, uh, testing of the device. Um, equipment operations such as operating the particle counter or microscope if the microscopic method is used. And then the device handling is quite important to make sure that it's being manipulated in the correct manner that is uh, typical of clinical use. Also, if you are uh, performing a particulate matter test in response to a 510K uh, or in interest of submitting a 510K review, you will want to include the appropriate QA uh, requirements. Um, this includes uh, any GLP options required um, such as uh, geo, uh, QA login and, and sample tracing, um, test auditing, and final report review. Continual particulate matter testing is also very important. So far, I've largely touched on uh, performing testing for purposes of a uh, submittal to a regulatory body. But continual particulate matter testing does make up the bulk of our work here at Nelson Labs in our particulate matter lab. Um, because particulate matter levels are often an indicator of overall cleanliness, we find that many of our customers prefer to run particulate matter testing alongside their other testing, such as BET or LAL, um, the equivalent to BET, bacterial endotoxin testing or cytotoxicity, uh, biocompatibility, and TOC or total organic carbon testing that we perform here. So we often find that those tests coincide very closely with particulate matter tests. Uh, the higher the levels of, of particulate matter, the higher the levels of many of those other uh, tests, which may lead to failures or, or a desire to look further into uh, the controls or environment in which the devices are being tested. And overall, continual particulate matter testing just helps to assure that systems and controls are within specification. So going on a little bit to some of the resources and standards available, um, the first one, just to get this one, well, not so much out of the way, but to address it because it is uh, kind of an, an easy one for those customers who have products that fit into this category, is EN45502 and ISO 14708. These two standards are harmonized, and they're applicable to active implantable devices. So things such as pacemakers and the uh, accessories that go along with those, such as leads. 
Um, this is an established standard for particulate matter testing of active implantable devices and their accessories. So this is a compendial method. It includes the extraction procedure and the acceptance criteria. So it will, it's not necessary to come up with your own procedure or your own acceptance criteria since it contains both. It does not typically include a vascular model or validation of the procedure. So uh, it makes things quite a bit simpler. Um, it's a semi-involved test with a semi-rigorous extraction whereby the device is placed in saline and orbital shaken for 8 to 18 hours at a physiological temperature, uh, 37 degrees C plus or minus 2. So it is a rather um, aggressive extraction, but it does not require many of the components that I mentioned prior. Another standard that our resource, or, well, a resource that's a guidance, uh, not a standard, but a guidance document from the FDA is one that I've referenced already, this PTCA catheters document, um, specifically section 13, dealing with particulate matter testing. Um, this document is rather lengthy, but doesn't include a lot of detail for particulate matter testing. It is somewhat helpful, though, and contains some key points. Um, it does talk uh, briefly about your sample test quantity. Um, it goes over the method validation and provides a great deal of uh, detail regarding that. And it also includes various steps that you'll want to include in the procedure. It uh, discusses worst case scenario of testing of the device in a clinical setting. Um, an example of this, for example, is exercising of a guide wire uh, because the physician may move that wire up and down several times within a procedure. It does recommend that uh, you know that wire be for example, exercised, say, you know, 10 to 20 times instead of the 2 to 5 that you might see normally. So that's just an, an example, but it does discuss worst case scenario. And it's frequently referenced by the FDA for various vascular devices, again, not just PTCA catheters, but nearly every sponsor that comes to us with uh, needing vascular uh, device testing and having consulted with the FDA is given this document as a starting point. Another one is uh, Technical Information Report, number 42, published in 2010 from Amy, uh, ANSI Amy. It's titled Evaluation of Particulates Associated with Vascular Medical Devices. It provides a great deal of information and guidance regarding a whole host of things. I couldn't list them all on one slide. <laughs> but as, as a, a view of some of the overalls, it does uh, describe some details regarding device design. So designing of the device prior to even testing or, or you know, getting to the, the stages we're discussing now, actual design of the device in the R&D stages. Um, it discusses reducing particulate matter levels on devices by taking certain precautions. Um, some of the things we discussed earlier, such as your environment, uh, handling, and, and the manufacturing um, uh, background of some of your analysts or rather technicians. Um, mimicking clinical use of the device and testing. Uh, that's also discussed by the FDA document. Uh, routine particulate matter testing. So it does go into some detail on recommendations for routine testing of particulate matter after the device has passed um, its, its uh, required review to get on the market. Um, setting acceptance criteria. This is a big one. Um, this can be pretty tricky because there aren't uh, guidance for acceptance criteria elsewhere for particulate matter on medical devices other than that EN and ISO standard listed earlier. However, that one is very specific to active implantables, so it's rarely leveraged for vascular devices. Many sponsors will leverage the USP 788 for their device, but that is not always the best um, uh, the best approach uh, for several reasons. One, the USB 788 does not apply to medical devices, but two, because in many cases the device may not be able to pass the acceptance criteria listed in the USB 788. Um, it's obviously much easier to clean a pharmaceutical product uh, via filtration than it is to assure that a medical device is clean and will not shed particulates. So we do find that many of the devices we test exceed those limits in the USB 788. Um, also, it, de it uh, discusses particulate identification to an extent, that is identifying the nature of the particulates on your product, um, determining where they come from, and trying to eliminate the sources. And then also setting action and alert limits um, to make sure that if you are approaching that, that cusp, that red zone, if you will, uh, of your acceptance criteria as to what 
uh, approaches may be taken there. Um, free, common approaches are performing the microscopic method in addition to the light obscuration um, for particulate matter uh, analysis and, and, uh, and recovery, um, but also doing some type of identification such as FTIR or Raman microscopy or even uh, SEM on your uh, on the particulates coming off of your device to determine where they're coming from, uh, what the uh, concern may be for those particulates introduced into the patient, um, if they are cytotoxic or, or if there's further issues that may result from introduction of those particles to the patient. Uh, here at Nelson, we have been consulting with the, or rather, we, we have had many conversations with the FDA and consulting with our customers over several years. Um, we're a testing laboratory that's been in business for about 25 years and have been performing particulate testing for about 15. Um, in the last 10 years, medical devices have been scrutinized considerably more, and thus we have been the pioneers and the, on the forefront of particulate matter testing for these devices, working with our sponsors to uh, develop test plans, to uh, address particulate matter levels on their devices, and come up with solutions for uh, having uh, for, for several different test uh, techniques and schemes. Um, we routinely write reports for the FDA and other regulatory bodies uh, for our customers and we'd be happy to help in consulting with your medical device, or your vascular device, uh, or any other questions you may have regarding particulate matter testing. For contact, you can reach Steve Lamb, who is the current study director in particulate matter testing here at Nelson Labs his email address and phone number are there. And then you may also reach me. I'm the department manager in the pharmaceutical section. Um, have been a study director for quite some time in uh, particulate matter. And my contact is also there. So you can reach either one of us with any questions you might have. And we would be happy to help. Thank you. And uh, we appreciate you participating in this webinar.